Like all belief systems, Christianity has grown and developed over time. Understanding the set of beliefs Christians hold today, many of which they take for granted or don't even know that they hold, requires peering back into the past and understanding where they came from. Today we're going to take a look at two sets of controversies that formed the early church and led to some of Christianity's distinct beliefs. One note before we start, the usual caveat applies about oversimplification. Most of these views have piles of books written about them, and a few sentences is hardly enough to do them justice, but hopefully it provides a basic framework. The first set of controversies in the early church are referred to as Trinitarian debates. Of course, that is a bit anachronistic, since the term Trinity was a result rather than a cause of the debates, but never mind that. They stemmed from a simple issue left by the early Jewish and Christian texts that formed Christianity's foundation, what do we do with Jesus, and to a lesser extent, the Holy Spirit? On the one hand, the Old Testament seems to endorse a strict monotheism, and the New Testament shares this belief. At the same time, it is apparent from the earliest Christian writings in the New Testament that the church viewed Jesus as divine, worshiping him in a way normally reserved for God himself. So there is one God, and Jesus seems to be in some sense God, but Jesus also relates to God the Father as someone separate from himself. He prays to the Father, speaks of him as if he has a separate authority, And so the church was left with this question, how do we square these realities? It is worth noting in all of what follows that the Holy Spirit, while less debated in the early church, is also in play. He seems to be something distinct from both Jesus, he falls on him at his baptism, and the Father, he is spoken of as proceeding from him, while also being divine. But we'll focus much of our discussion on the Son, because that's where most of the church's debates occurred. Anyway, there are a few options to reconcile these different realities about Jesus. The first is tritheism, or some kind of polytheism. It might simply be the case that there are different gods. While modern hearers might find this an intriguing concept, it was almost unheard of in the early church. Both Jewish monotheism and Platonic philosophy, another major player in some of these debates, found the idea of multiple equal deities to be untenable. After all, if God is absolute and infinite, it's hard to explain how two separate such beings could exist. One view that does tread close to this sort of polytheism was Marcionism, championed by, surprise, Marcion of Sinope. He rejected the Old Testament and Judaism in general, viewing the Old Testament God as an evil being and the New Testament God as a separate deity at war with this Old Testament, and given the strong strand of anti-Semitism that seemed to motivate his thinking, notably Jewish being. This view was pretty roundly condemned by the early church. Marcion was excommunicated in the 140s, and all of the groups we're about to discuss found such a polytheistic view unthinkable. So, all right, the church largely agreed there was only one God. What then do we make of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? One option is that Jesus wasn't really God at all, but just a human being, and that the language we mentioned above is figurative. Some within Jewish Christianity held a view called Ebionism. It's hard to reconstruct much about this group as it was seemingly small and separatist and largely described only by its critics, but it seems to be invested in the idea that while Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, he was in no sense divine. This view never seems to have become widespread, largely because the earliest traditions about Jesus seem to push him into something more than just human territory. A more common idea was called monarchianism, which focused on God's absolute oneness. And confusingly, monarchianism as a label contains two very different views under it. The first is modalism. It holds that there is one God, but that he exists in different roles or modes. This view is often called Sabellianism as well, after a priest named Sabellius. The simplest way to think of this view is to say that there's a difference between the Father, Son, and Spirit, but that difference only exists in our perception as human beings. There's only one God, but based on what he's up to, we sometimes call that God Father, and at other times we call it Son. The second form of monarchianism is called adoptionism. It holds that there is only one God in one person, like modalism, but it sees Jesus as different from that God. He was an especially admirable man who God then granted divinity, either at his baptism or his resurrection. Thus, Jesus is divine, but he started as a human being, and most adoptionists would argue that he is still somehow subordinate to God himself. Unlike the first few views we mentioned, both forms of monarchianism still exist in the present. Modalism is the view of the Oneness Pentecostal movement found in various places around the world, and adoptionism is found both in some strands of Unitarianism and in groups like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In addition to monarchianism, another option is to endorse monotheism in the sense that there is one ultimate god, but to see there being a series of lesser gods is coming out of this central deity. One view that did this was Gnosticism. Gnosticism is tricky to talk about. It represents a diverse set of traditions that basically fused Judeo-Christian ideas with what is called Neoplatonism, a philosophical tradition coming out of Plato. It is known for being dualistic, with spirit as good and matter as evil, but it also usually sees a series of divine beings as proceeding from the original divinity. 
It's impossible to summarize all of those diverse ways of talking about that, but typically Gnosticism saw the sun as being one of these lesser beings, perhaps the supreme of these lesser beings, and some forms of Gnosticism also skewed into the same territory as Marcionism. Since matter is evil, it views the Old Testament creator God as another lesser and evil divine being. Another view, and perhaps the most popular one besides the eventual consensus in the early church, was Arianism. Arianism agrees that the sun is divine, but argues that he was created, began to exist at some point in time. Thus he came from the Father in a way different from any other being, making him God-like in a unique way from the rest of creation, but still a lesser being than the pre-existent Father. If this sounds like adoptionism, the difference is that in Arianism this happened before creation and long before the Son's incarnation as Jesus. At this point, before describing how those debates played out, let's try to describe what came to be known as the orthodox position. Obviously, that label was only applied after the fact, since orthodox means right belief, but its view rested on the insistence that there is one God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit, but those three persons share one being or essence. This is going to be hard to explain simply. Frankly, that's true of most of these views. But basically, what became orthodoxy insisted that one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were one in terms of their essence as God, all three are equally the same deity, not one properly being God and the others only becoming God at some point in time, but they are also distinct from each other. The term person can be tricky here, as it means something technical rather than literal, but it insists that some distinction between the three persons exists within God himself, not simply within our perception. That within the Godhead, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, but all are equally the same God. So how did this view become the dominant position? Well, there are really two answers depending on which alternative views we consider. Many of the views we mentioned, especially the earlier ones, were rejected by the church through a kind of informal general consensus. Church fathers like Irenaeus wrote against them, and over time they simply slipped away into obscurity. That's true of views like Ebionism and Gnosticism. While still present in some parts of the church, they don't ever seem to represent dominant ideas. That said, there were exceptions, the largest of which was Arianism. In the 300s, it was unclear whether Arianism thought or what came to be known as Orthodox thought would ultimately triumph in the church. The Emperor Constantine, himself a Christian convert, was baptized by an Arian, and is thought by many to be sympathetic to its cause. He called the Council of Nicaea in 325, which ultimately condemned Arianism as heretical and resulted in what we now call the Nicene Creed, but Constantine's son Constantius was openly pro-Arian, exiling supporters of the Nicene formulation like Athanasius and holding a smaller council designed to favor Arianism. This led to decades of strife. Constantius' his son Julius, himself a pagan, swung support back toward the Orthodox party in order to keep the fires of division burning. After his death and the reign of Valens, Arianism seemed ascendant again. It wasn't until the reign of Theodosius and the First Council of Constantinople in 381 that the theological current fully swung against Arianism and Nicaea was reaffirmed. This was only complicated by the fact that most of the missionaries who brought Christianity to the Germanic tribes in the north of Europe were Arians. It was several hundred more years until tribes like the Goths and Vandals came under the banner that was now being thought of as orthodoxy. All of which can seem messy, because it is. Some people view the story as purely political, with the doctrinal debates inconsequential and the real change being a result of the exercise of power. While power and politics were a significant part of this debate, that does probably do them an injustice. The orthodox formulation did offer significant theological advantages. It provided a relatively simple framework that kept a clear distinction between God on the one hand and creation on the other, but at the same time it accounted for the unique nature of Jesus and explained how he can be worshipped as God while also being in relationship with the Father. At the same time these debates were raging, a second but related set of issues was also being discussed, that of Christology. If the Trinitarian debates were about in what sense Jesus was God, the Christological ones centered on in what sense he was both God and a human being. Many of the views we already discussed had Christological implications. Gnosticism, for example, tended to view Jesus as God and his humanity as merely an illusion. This makes sense since they saw physicality as evil and so creating a problem for God taking on a human body. This position, that Jesus was pure spirit with just an illusory body, came to be known as docetism, from the Greek word for to appear. A second position was Nestorianism. This one is tricky because in recent years some writings of Nestorius have emerged that call into question just how accurate our historical portrait of the view is, but here's what we can probably say. Nestorius himself first came to prominence not for talking about Jesus, but about Mary. He was uncomfortable calling Mary the mother of God, and instead wanted to talk about her only as the mother of Christ. This stemmed from the fact that in reconciling Jesus' two natures, Nestorius wanted to keep them very separate, holding that there were two distinct persons in the one being of Jesus. 
The other extreme in this debate came to be known as monophysitism. In monophysitism, the divine and human natures merge in such a way that the divine overpowers the human, thus meaning that Jesus has only one nature, a sort of divine one. The form of monophysitism present in these debates was called Eutychianism, which held that thanks to this merging, while Jesus had a human nature, he was not, properly speaking, a human being. A word about terms like nature and person in these debates. They came to have a technical meaning, which we should keep in mind, but the easiest way to picture the debate is to imagine that we have an idea of humanness and divineness in Jesus. The question is, how close do they get to each other? In Nestorianism, they are being kept far apart. In monophysitism, they are merged in some way that changes the whole idea of humanness. What became the orthodox position tried to steer a middle ground between these extremes. It argued that Jesus was one person with two natures, not one being with two completely separate persons, but also not one person with one combined nature. Jesus was fully human, he had a human mind, body, and will, and was also fully divine, with a divine mind and will as well. This middle idea became known as the hypostatic union. Nestorianism was rejected at the Council of Ephesus in 431, and Eutychianism was similarly condemned at the Council of Chalcedon 20 years later. The Chalcedonian Creed used by many churches is a summary of those beliefs. One last note on those Christological debates. Unlike the Trinitarian positions, both Nestorian and Monophysite Christian traditions continued from that time until today. Nestorianism largely spread east into Central Asia and even China. Monophysitism existed in parts of the Middle East and North Africa. Neither are particularly large today, but both have representatives in the modern world. Also interestingly, both groups have largely moved back into theological communion with more traditional Christian groups, nuancing their views in ways their earlier proponents didn't seem to share. A final question, what does this matter? Well, if you don't care about Christianity, it largely doesn't, at least not as more than a philosophical or historical curiosity. However, even that can be misleading because even for those outside of Christianity, it is worth understanding someone's views before criticizing them. Every world religion is a complex and nuanced system, and entering into dialogue with any of them requires respect for and appreciation of that complexity and nuance. For those who are Christians, these beliefs are important because they describe who God is. While they perhaps don't have much bearing on the practical life of a lay believer, they are still compelling. The personal connection believers feel with the different persons of the Trinity, or the way they interact with Jesus as a human being and as God in the, their thinking, have profound spiritual implications. More than that, they provide part of the framework within which Christian theology operates. Changes to these doctrines have profound effects for the broader systems of thought based in Scripture. What you think about God is going to affect what you think about the rest of theology. Ultimately, though, for Christians, they matter because they are poor but earnest attempts to talk about God. If he is a being we think of as really existing, then understanding him isn't simply pedantic theology, but the foundations for relationship and trust. Mm -hmm.